is high drama intractable in what we thought of the plays? Play Company is presenting Stefano Messina's Intractable Woman, which sheds light on Anna Politkovskaya, a Russian human rights journalist who reported on the Chechnyan wars from 1999 until she was murdered in 2006. The fact that we know Anna's fate it doesn't deter from the suspense or immediacy of her reporting and actions. The three actors, Nadine Malouf, Nicole Shalhoub, and Stacey Yen, interchanging the narrative of events brings us a riveting and harrowing tale on both sides that will leave your blood cold and your passions hot on what people are capable of doing to each other and for what. Normally, one would take on the side of the people wanting their independence, but in this case, their methods are so brutal that it is hard to feel sympathy. And that is where we see what a great journalist Anna was, as she fairly presented both sides and gets murdered for her effort. Stefano Mussini makes historical facts so alive, and with the way the actors seamlessly inhabit Anna, made for very compelling theater. Lee Sunday Evans has proven time and again what a formidable director she is. Now, I had a t difficult time watching this. I was crying before it started, during it, afterwards, because it, may, it reminded me of Stephen Vincent, my friend and neighbor, who was the first journalist murdered in, in Iran, Iraq, during all that, what was, the you know, going on. So it's like, I was just really upset. And the thing is, people, you know, of course we love our servicemen, but journalists they do a lot to for our country as well and, and get murdered and put themselves in danger to give us the truth and sometimes we forget about how important journalists are too <clears throat> and this reminds us so really this is you've only got this week and it closes October 14th but this deserves a Pulitzer Prize it's brilliant the new group presents The True, written by Shar White, directed by Scott Elliott, that deals with Albany politics in 1977, and Edie Falco plays a longtime political operative who's been helping the mayor for more than 40 years stay in office, but now there are big challenges to him, politically and also emotionally, because although they've never really had a sexual affair, they've been very close and it seems to now be disturbing both of their spouses. So that's the story. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't know that much about Albany politics or any politics outside of New York City, really. So I found this fascinating because these are real historical people and they were humanized by Char White as real people and not just political figures. I mean, mm -hmm. I actually wikipedia them afterwards to find out if they were oh. real and I was like, oh my God, and it was like really interesting to read about them. So. And with politics approaching on our life right now, this is even more enlightening because they really do, you know, do backroom politics with the men and cigars and, mm -hmm. and figuring out who's going to win or anything. But it also is really like democratic machine, which you normally think, oh, political machine's terrible, but they actually do fairly good things. They're the good guys in this. Yeah, I mean, and the, and the, the thing is, even though Albany is a big city in the capital mm -hmm. and all, they, like, have little wards, and they all know each other's names, and they go to dinner, and they help them out. I mean, it's really intimate yeah, the way it's done. Yeah, helping the widows and poor children, you know, so, so it's but, good stuff but, sometimes. But what happens, this is 1970s, when a woman gets involved and tries to manipulate the events behind the scenes. Can women have the same influence and respect that a man gets automatically? And I, and, and you were enthralled by um, Edie Falco. Oh, she, I, she's the best. But I was totally enthralled by Peter Scolari because he just, she talked and talked and talked. I mean, she had the show with your part. Mm -hmm. And he, with, uh, with, with no expression, conveyed so much just with pouring a drink. It, I mean, really, pay attention to Peter Scolari, too. I, and Michael McKeon, as, as a politician, was just so perfect in the part. And, and this really is like a, when Harry met Sally, can two people really of the opposite sex be friends? Anyway, I just found this was so damn good. Scott Elliott did a great job, and so did the new group. Yeah, I, it's a really fine production. Recently, I just saw the play called What the Constitution Means to Me. And it is like very revealing because I still do not understand many things what it means to me. 
you know, as an immigrant coming from another country, which is considered like the third world country, where people say there's no democracy and no con nobody, there's no constitution. I never heard the word constitution, but even if it is there, nobody follows it, it seems like. But my disappointment in this country is after I saw this show, especially the 14th Amendment, the Constitution seemed like giving all the rights to men and nothing to women. Oh, and well, we should explain what, what, what the story is. Is Heidi Schreck, when she was a teenager and her, like 15 years old, she used to go to these American Legion posts with her mother all over Washington State and giving a lecture about what the Constitution means to me in order to get scholarship money to go to college. And she was really into witches at the time so, and the Salem witch trial, so she kind of put that in, it's a big cauldron. And as she pointed out, like Bina just said, if you read the Constitution, they don't mention women at all. So that makes, that's why it's so easy if you follow the word of the of these Constitution that, you know, women are not there, so we can ignore them and minorities and everyone else. And she goes into great depth on the 14th and the 9th Amendment. And uh, we also get a, a copy of the yeah. Constitution at it, so that helps us in it. You know, for millions of times, politicians and everybody else in this country mentions on TV and everywhere, Constitution, 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 you know? And I tried to actually read that, and I never understood much at all, you know? She and, makes it very accessible. Yeah, she, but she, it's like, it's amazing with this such a, I, I have to say it's a dull subject for me because, because I never understood it. She made it so exciting. She is such a great performer that I was like saying, this woman, I need to work with her. You know, she is a dynamic personality, great energy, fabulous diction, you know. So I was mesmerized. Yeah, I, it's very, and it's very done very conversationally, even though it's very scripted. You, it feels like it's very off the cuff. And Mike Iverson is there, and he's like the referee, and he's teenager. so... Teenager. Mention the teenager. I will. Um, let me talk about Mike Iverson first. So Mike Iverson, who is a referee, uh, he's really, as he's really rigid, rigid. Yeah. as a character, he's rigid. He's like, he's like this. He's yeah. standing, and he never yeah. moves. Yeah. But then when he becomes Mike Iverson at the end, he's all of a sudden relaxed. He has his T-shirt, and what Mark was trying, but I was going to get to. He loves interrupting even when he's not here, <laughs> doesn't he? A typical man. <laughs> anyway, that we there's two different high school students. We had Thursday Williams, who's this wonderful, vivacious teenager, and her and Heidi got into an actual debate in front of us about should we abolish the Constitution or not. And and you you the both sides were both so salient points made yeah. that you kind of like wow you know you don't know what to think you know except you do leave thinking. Yeah, just this. Um, you, you just um, I came here with the great American dream and and really possibility of the dream coming true. The more I listen to these things, and it's educational for me. The more I realize how backward this country had been. I mean, right now there are thousands of women marching for about the sexual harassment case of Kavanaugh, and like. Uh, those women existed even before, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you know, whenever this constitution was written. Yeah, when we and, saw this, we didn't know what the outcome was going to yeah, be. Right, right. And I, now that we so I, I can't stop crying. So, so I realized that third world, first world, second world, whatever, wherever the second world is, men rule, men rule everything. And men are really, 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 really nasty to women yep. in, in every which way. And it seemed like that, what we were watching is happening outside on the television. You know, I, I'm very pissed because, because I mean, people, men never let you talk. Not, I mean, I'm not talking about I Mark. apologize. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. <laughs> they do not let you express an opinion which might be different from the majority opinion or somebody else's opinion. They call you minority, but they do not want a woman minority to represent present that opinion, to express that opinion, which they might dislike. And I think that's hundreds of years ago the same thing. You see how passionate this play spurs people on. That is why you really should go see it. It might help you in the present situation to calm you down. I don't know because I'm not calm. I love this performer. I told Kevin and he's going to go and pay for it and going to see the show. And he's American and he needs to learn and a, a, and, about, a, and, and a, a white man. A straight white man. Yeah, and he should know about the Constitution and tell me when he criticized me about other things. He should <laughs> tell, tell the Constitution also. He should criticize that too. 
Hershey Felder is back at 5090's 59th Street Theaters before he brought us a Leonard Bernstein and Maestro and now we're getting to hear about Irving Berlin and he's doing the same thing he's pretending that we're carolers the audience and he invites us in and he tells us about his life and his being an immigrant from Russia and oh and about you know is he, he used to be a tabloid headline because he was uh, pursuing one of the wealthiest uh, guy's daughter, the Comstock Load Fortune Harris, and all that went through. Plus, we get to hear Irving Berlin songs. We get to sing along with Irving Berlin songs. We get to hear some gossip about Irving Berlin, his ups, his downs. It was very entertaining, especially if you love Irving Berlin. You will thoroughly enjoy this. So I am giving this a happy face minus, but it's very good. Gunnar Montana is the choreographer, director, creative director, music, art installation, and graffiti art person behind King House, which is set in a decadent underground club, perhaps in Berlin. It's an hour-long dance piece featuring drag queens, muscle boys, gym rats, and fierce women. These are all gay fantasy types that strut before us to upbeat music. The choreography is muscular and gymnastic. It's very exciting in its virtuosity. And he teaches us gay vocabulary, and there's exciting lighting, and the, um, a woman in a G-string sliding around on a <laughs> uh, body oil greased board, and just cool stuff. It's not quite as elegant as Company XIV, but it has the same kind of gay, friendly exuberance and dance. I'm giving it a happy face, and you only have till October 14th to see it. A Lovely Sunday for Crab Core by Greatest Tennessee Williams. He wrote this play, I think, in 1979, and I always hated the critics talking, saying that he cannot write the greatest play anymore. But in this play, I was just a little... Uh, this play is about, let me tell you about it. There's like four lonely women. Uh, one is Dorothea and, and one is Bodhi. They're roommates in a very, very, very cluttered, cluttered, cluttered apartment, which I didn't like the set, but perhaps it is supposed to be there. And she is waiting, Dorothea is waiting for a phone call from... from a, the principal. So, so lover, you know, like she calls him like a lover and she's going to be happy for the rest of her life. And Bodhi is preparing to go for a picnic at the Spark. Crevcour. Uh, Crevcour. And uh, she's making chicken and this and this. And then she's like... Devil day. Yeah. <laughs> she, she has the intention of her twin brother marrying Dorothea. She's just imagining this, this dream. And then this uh, other thir third character, which is uh, Annette O'Toole, plays Helena. She comes in. Another the, school teacher. Yes, another school teacher. And she wants Dorothea to share the room uh, with her in her better area, better apartment. But the th the, for oh, me, and the, the problem... And also, and also there's an upstairs neighbor who's... A she's German, also German. A German yeah, woman. Whose, whose mother just died. And all she, she just speaks German. And no one seems to like her except for uh, B Bodhi. Who's because it, she's also German. She's also, also German. She's right. sympathetic, right. So the thing is, this, my problem began with, with both these ladies. I could not understand them. I could not understand them. I tried so very hard. You know, I want to hear... Tennessee Williams' words, you know, I don't care how bad the actress might be. They were not bad. I could not hear them. I think D Dorothea really had problem doing the southern accent. And scene was very, 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 very long, so it put me in a bad mood, you know. Well, you think it also could be, and we should explain, uh, Bina just had eye surgery. That's why she has sunglasses on. So you think that could have been it because you just recover, you're still recovering that, from that eye surgery? It could have been if I couldn't see. I could, I could you know, like from distance, the, my doctor has made me, uh, from the distance vision better and my uh, reading is ruined I could not hear them see I had no trouble hearing them I yeah. mean yeah I, I, I mean I couldn't understand them I should say I, could, I, should, I could not understand them I yeah. could and I, I see I love Christine Nielsen because you know I'm German my parents are German my relatives are German I get Germans and Germans apparently are looked down upon in St. Louis which is where this takes place why I don't know why, they just are. They're 1937, like, right? That, it takes place in 1937, but it, it wasn't even that. It's just like, you know, German immigrants. It's like they're uh -huh. not Americans. Uh -huh. I mean, we haven't gotten into World War II yet. I and see, then yeah. you have uh, the Southern Belle, which is, you know, 
the, the, the young teacher yeah. who uh, has dreams of this guy marrying. In fact, yeah. the thing is, these are typical Tennessee Williams characters, yeah, characters as they are yeah. four desperate women. Uh, Dorothea is desperate to get marry this guy. Um, Christine Nelson is desperate for Dorothea to marry her brother. Yeah, yeah. Annette Tool Helena is desperate for her to move into this apartment with her so that they, she can have a company and some, save some money. And no, well, also, yeah, no, no, yeah. live in a better neighborhood, as you say. Yeah. And then the, the German woman is just desperate for like companionship, like you said, yeah. because she's so, you know, yeah. she just lost her mother and. Yeah. and that you should not give that woman coffee. Yeah. I thought, why do they keep? And also, the <laughs> one thing that I thought was odd was this German woman, the neighbor. All she did was speak German. She never spoke English. Yeah. Yet Christy Nelson did not talk to her in German, but, but talked to her in English, yeah. and she seemed to understand. She understood, that was yeah. kind. I mean, I know that's like a you know a convention. Plot, yeah, plot convention. You know, but it was, that seemed that was nice because she seemed she she cared for her. She affectionate to her. You don't have to have that language. To the body gestures were. Incredible there, mm. but you see the th the thing is just I met Tennessee Williams. I mean, for fifteen minutes he talked to me, so I didn't realize how desperate he can be. I re I have read biographies. I've read a lot uh, about Tennessee Williams, and now I'm beginning to see more of Tennessee Williams in all his mm. women, much more now, and especially when he's written the play much later on in his time. He was dying, and I would love to meet him again and come and I say to him, "You were so great, you were so successful. Why you were so worried to have another hit you know on Broadway but he, 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 he was so all right but he's, yeah. he's and we should say this was directed by Austin Pendleton, but you know and um and we should say that uh, oh, now I lost my train of thought go on no the Austin Pendleton, you know this is the second oh yes. Yes. That Tennessee Williams is very good at creating desperate women and frustrated women. Anyway, I'm giving this... And Austin I'm, Pendleton anyway. might not be the best director to, to, to bring that desperation out from those actresses, perhaps. I do not know. Anyway, but, I'm giving this a happy face minus. Well, I I have to have a mix. If you want to see a Tennessee Williams play that's very rarely done, and you like Tennessee Williams, and, and really, the cast is so phenomenal. Leslie DeLeo saw Because I Could Not Stop an Encounter with Emily Dickinson, which was presented by Ensemble for the Romantic Century. Angelica Page played M Emily Dickinson in a way that incorporated wry wit and felt a lot like Dorothy Parker on Quaaludes. <laughs> there was music and a soprano singing as well, and the text was from Emily's letters and poems. There's a lot more on Facebook, but she liked it very much, felt it had a well-constructed set, and relevant information was projected. She gave it a happy face. The Irish Repertory Theater is bringing us the one-woman musical dynamo, Lenya Rideout in Wild Abandon, directed by Lisa Roth. This is all about her mother played Lynn, and she does such a good job of, of delineating between her mother and her, and um, and her, her her loves and her music and her, and and how she did cabaret and she's done yeah. Broadway and yeah, jump it's in. interesting that her mom was a painter, and the set is sort of like the mother's studio with a lot of her real paintings and a lot of the daughter's musical instruments, so it combines both of them. And the mother sort of, her, her paintings are often about mothers who could not bond with their infant daughters. And, and we should say the scene with design was Narell Sish, Sishan. It's really quite good. Yeah, it really is. And um, Lynn's pro uh, Lina's problem seems to be that she always picks his boyfriends, these lost boys, who won't commit and you know, like, don't really give her very much to go on. It was really, it was just, she's, you know, she's a really good storyteller. And I and very talented singer. Right. And I ju musician. I just, I just wish she didn't say Wild Abandon so many times. And, yeah, we and know the title. <laughs> and, and even though the story is predictable and everything, it doesn't matter. It was told so well, and the music was really good. And you get to learn a little bit about backstage you know, touring things, and I just, I, I give it a happy face minus. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely enjoyable. Primary Stages is presenting Final Follies, three short plays by A.R. Gurney, directed by David Sink, 
and the three plays all deal with various characters who are unsatisfied with their lives and searching for love and or a more meaningful life. Final Follies has a guy, Nelson, who was like a wasp where do, ne'er do well, the waning of the wasp culture, who finds sort of fulfillment and the possibility for love as being a porn star. The Rape of Bunny Stunts is a, a woman who's now a chairman of some organization who um, seems to be, all her stuff is locked in this box and she's very much in control, but there's a mysterious stranger who may have the key. And the love course, a teen, teen taught class about love and literature that ends up being more passionate and explosive <laughs> by the performers of the, um, the teachers and perhaps a very strange lesson for the students of the class. <laughs> yes, I love Ava Gurney because mm -hmm. I watched it on, I saw it on, on, on Saturday after the whole stupid Kavanaugh thing. Yeah, and miserable it, day. I know, it just made me laugh, it cheered me up mm -hmm. and God, the acting was so wonderful. Colin Hanlon is just so adorable where he, he first he plays this like, you know, guy who gets, you know, he talks about the dying watch culture and, and, and becoming involved in this porn thing. And then he's like this student like who doesn't know why he's there in the first sort place. Sort of a messenger against his will. And, and Rachel Nix, oh my God, she's gorgeous. Yes. As she was great as a, as a student kind of sucked into everything and then as a, the person in charge as a receptionist. And um, the most wonderful costume. She's, you know, like um, great actress and her wonderful body and beautiful face were perfectly on display. Yeah, David Muir did a great job with costumes. Mm. Uh, wait till you see what the professor is wearing. Pay attention to the print yes. on that. Uh, uh, Mark Junick is Walter, um, the brother, the waspy brother. Greg Malavi is the grandfather. Deborah Rush as uh, Bunny, and then there's uh, Peter Merrick and Betsy Adam. I j it was yeah. Just Peter Merrick is just such a great comic actor with this, you know. His face just cracks you up when you look at him, and he really delivers the lines with perfect timing. And Betsy Aiden is just always delightful. I mean, that's just it. This was just so much fun, and it yeah. was just del just so entertaining. This gets a major happy face. I'm giving it a happy face, but I didn't like the second play about Bunny Stultz quite as much. But it belonged with the rest of them because it was all about, you know... It dealt with love, the, frustration, and danger. danger. Definitely go. The Evolution of Man with music and lyrics by Douglas Cohn and book and lyrics by Dan Ellis with Max Crum, Ali Trim, and Leslie ha Hyatt was the most cutest, most adorable musical about getting over love, finding love, getting love back, and it was just. Absolutely, it had the most wonderful songs. The unromantic things was my favorite. Yes. No. Okay. Uh, I oh, really here we are. First of all, with Jan Ewing, yeah. you finally get to meet him. Hi there. Hi there. Uh, I really thought this was a lot of fun. Um, it really was. Uh, young and, and beautiful and such so well integrated. The music was, was lovely, tuneful, uh, beautiful record, beautiful, um, beautiful arrangements uh, with the cello and. And uh, really, and, the, um, and it was so well coordinated. It was like Sondheim in the sense that it, that the music is so beautifully coordinated with the lyrics and the book that you don't you're not aware the music is starting and that it fits in so well. You know, it's not just a cue for a song. Uh, you know, really, all of the all of the lyrics were marvelously you know uh, uh, apt, and the performances were really fine uh, and really, really uh, lots of uh, you know real good acting. I mean, different. Uh, same people playing different parts, and that was wonderful. And I think it should be a uh, happy face plus. What oh, think? absolutely. Major happy face, happy face plus. plus. And there'll be way much more on Facebook, believe yes. me. We have yes. a lot to say how much we love it. And this. I'll, I'm going to write a longer review, yes, but I really like it. At Playwrights Horizon is Craig Lucas's new play, I Was Most Alive With You. It's a retelling of the Job story in which um, a TV writer, Ash, seems to have everything, but then, like in Job, one disaster after another, he loses it. His son, who also is a Job-like character, is a gay deaf man, and there's a chorus of um, 
deaf people who are signing ASL above, sort of like a heavenly or Greek chorus. Will spirituality be able to help these people with their problems with addiction and uh, questioning God and loss of love? It's a very moving and very dramatic play, and you don't have too much time left to see it, so please rush to Playwrights Horizon, two major happy faces. Yes, you'll hear what I have to say on Facebook. It was really very. And now we're to see the plays that we talked about. And um, I was most alive with you. Wait till the second act because the first act is sort of disjointed and confusing, but but it comes together really in the second act. It's really good, but I wasn't sure with the first act. I love the seeing plays. They are one of my favorite theaters in doing Faustus. I'm hoping to see Hitler's Tasters. It looks really good. And Travisville is written by William Jackson Harper. And the winning side is an astronaut story. And I'm going to be talking about this one on the next show. Some great cabaret events are going on. Richard Skipper celebrates is going to be at Lori Beachman, and he won't have another one until December. And Max Vernon is going to be at Joe's Pub. And the triad, the first annual Trump family special. I went to a press conference with Anthony Scaramucci, and it is hysterical and brilliant. So go to my YouTube channel, Eva Heinemann, and you can see the whole press conference there. And the fringe is back. I hope I'll get to it. Uh, Broadway Unplugged is Saturday, October 13th at 7.30. That's the Scott Siegel event. One Minute Play Festival. And NAMT is back, which has all those 45-minute uh, musicals. Drowsy Chaperone came from there. Bill Irwin on back. It's going to be at the Irish Rep. Porn to be a Stars at the Wild Project. BAM has a bunch of stuff going on. Kurt Vonnegut's Mother Night at 59. And Terrence McNally is having his 80th birthday celebration at 92nd Street. Why? I can't wait to see that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Todd Solons has a play at the flea called Emma and Max. And here are some plays we'll talk about on our future show. Popcorn Foral is directed by um, Christian Borel. Urban Stage Retrospect has like all their old plays with amazing people doing it. So that should be really cool. And plays that are closed that we talked about. Neurosis, Bebop, and Pamela's First Musical at Red Bank. Some parody productions. Don't forget to pick up your performing arts side. Art Arts Insider at Cultural Heartbeat of New York City, next show, October 27th. Thank you, William Cataldi, for filming the Evolution of Man review for us. Don't forget to go on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, Eva Heinemann. There you can see the press conference for the first Tramp musical and more.